Hello folks, welcome back. Uh, I've given this clock a little bit more examination and I just want to do a review of where we've come so far and to see what's left to at least make all the pieces work. And after we know how all the clock mechanism runs, we will start disassembling and cleaning the movement and trying to get this back to good operating condition. Just as a review, we looked at the wiring terminals on top of the case and we figured out what the positive and negative terminals were and that the clock runs on about 18 volts. Um, I, I still think it's probably a 24 volt nominal clock to allow for the load of the slaves and the bells and some uh, battery rundown, but it seems to be happy with 18. We took a look at how these contacts work. There's one right now. Uh, on the back side of the escape wheel, and then we have the other one coming up right here. That's the one on the back side winds the movement. The one on the front side drives the slave. Around the movement, we have our bell solenoids. This is bell zone one, bell zone two, bell zone three, bell zone four. And this is our slave clock. right there, triggered off the front contact. So this is all making pretty good sense. Down at the bottom of the clock, we have some bell selector switches. These will determine which zones will ring. This is zone one, two, three, and four. If these switches are to the right, they're not connected to anything. If they're to the left, they make contact there. Um, and then we have this guy is, it's, it's labeled wind, and I can actually, if I push this, we can see we can manually wind the clock with that button. This one over here says clocks, and so what I believe this does is this advances the slaves. We'll investigate that in a minute. At the bottom of the clock are these four buttons, and these are manual bell overrides. So if I push this first button, that, corresponds with the first solenoid. Second button corresponds to the second solenoid. Third and fourth, as you would expect. So the major issue with this clock is the tape mechanism is not advancing. I can manually move this a minute at a time here, and I can manually move this. Uh, I don't know how, how long this is, if this is six hours or or, or what that is. This I haven't looked in detail at this mechanism, but this is not being driven by the clock. And I believe the reason for that is this hanging wire here. I traced out the two wires to the tape solenoid, those guys right there. One of them goes up to one of the power buses on the top. And the other one comes in here to this movement. It, this may look like it's actually electrically connected to the clock frame, and it actually isn't. You can see those are some insulating washers there. And this is the other half of that. So where does this go? Well, if we look around here, this um, contact on the opposite side of the winding solenoid is what connects this screw to this lever here. And on this lever, you can see these three screws. The one in the middle has a little hanging piece of wire on it, which I believe is the other end of this. So I'm going to reattach that and we'll give it a try and see if we can make the, the tape mechanism run. All right, I have reattached the wire. By the way, this is lacquered wire. So this looks like it's bare wire, but it actually isn't. It's covered in an insulating coating. And so if you ever have to do what I did and you know trim off a little of the end and then uh, reuse it because of a break, you need to use some sandpaper to get rid of the lacquer coating so you can make electrical contact. So this switch mechanism should be functional now. And I'm just gonna actuate this with my finger here. There we go. There is only one solenoid on this mechanism. And so when I actuate it with the switch up here, that drives the drum 
that uh, runs the, the tape. These fingers make contact here and will ring the bells. So how do you drive these, this top drum, and what do they do? Um, there, as I mentioned, there's only one electrical input to this. And the way that the, uh, the day of the week wheel is driven is actually via a gear train on the back of this. If I hold down our minute advance lever, I can turn this manually and this goes around a number of times. You can see the, the lever above the, the drum rising. Almost to the top. And there we go, we just advanced. So we've got um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and there are different rows of pins here that correspond to day and night of the day of the week. So if we look here, we right now are on the pins between Sunday and Monday. So this is the Sunday PM run of pins. When these pins are contacting these levers, that is creating a gap here so that the contact does not come into play no matter if the tape has a hole that passes through or not. So if you don't want the clock to ring, then you put this row of pins in for whichever zones. And this clock has four totally independent zones, which means there are four sets of pins here. Right now, as configured, there is no ringing at all on Saturday. This is the Friday night into Saturday, Saturday night into Sunday, Sunday night into Monday, and then we ring on Monday, if I advance this, like so. Uh, now we are in the Monday day period, and because these pins are no longer pushing down, these contacts are making contact. And so that will mean that if the tape um, has a, a hole punched in it, this will make contact and trigger the bell. So this is Monday during the day, Monday night not going to operate, Tuesday during the day, no pins, so it's gonna ring, Wednesday during the day it's gonna ring, Thursday during the day it's gonna ring, etc. So that's pretty cool. All of this is driven off a single pulse, and the result of this is an electrical contact, which according to the paper tape location, fires these solenoids and rings our bells. So I think we understand, at least in broad strokes, the entire function of this clock. Um, I think I want to service this movement because I have no idea when that was last done. I'm sure it needs work. You can see the oxidation on the front plate, and this is because of the hole in the dial that allows you to see the escapement. It's kind of interesting that the rest of the front plate's in relatively good condition but right where there was uh, sunlight probably, um, there's oxidation here on, on the main movement plate. This is gonna be a little bit of an adventure to get out of the clock because of all of these wires and contacts. So I'm gonna probably end up doing that off camera because this is the first time I've worked on this particular clock. Uh, but I will get it out and then we will take it apart in more depth and see how the movement itself runs. I was able to take a few pictures of the movement to figure out where things will go back and I have disconnected all of the wires, keeping track of where they go. So I think this is ready to come out. The movement has this nice cast iron bracket that's mounted on the clock case. We don't need to take that off and what's kind of nice is the pendulum is hung from this rear bracket so I can leave the pendulum right in the clock. What I need to do is get out these four pins, and then the movement should come free. Here's our movement out of the clock. This is the front, of course. We see our oxidized spot from the front. It actually feels greasy. That's kind of interesting. Uh, we have our solenoid at the bottom that winds on the back. We have our crutch. This has a external beat adjuster at the top. That's very handy. Down here, we have something important. This lever adjusts the um, 
relay mechanism that winds the, uh, the main gear here. I'm going to take careful note of the position of this lever because this is going to adjust how much this winds per actuation of the solenoid. Uh, we've got our adjustable verge pivot in the back there and in the front. And this is a relatively straightforward movement, at least on the mechanical side. We can see on the, the winding gear down here, this is what winds the clock when the solenoid pulls. This tooth engages and it advances there. And then up here, this is essentially the click spring, which keeps the wheel from unwinding. The spring in this clock is this coil spring that is mounted here. And that gives the clock, I'm not exactly sure how much runtime, maybe half an hour of runtime. Uh, I've wound it up manually and it, it runs for a good while. So that would give you some hope that at least your master clock would tell the time if the power goes out. That being said, unless your slave clocks were powered by uh, batteries as well, even if your master's right, you would still have to reset all of your slaves to match the master. We'll talk about the slaves in another video. About the only thing that should be out of the ordinary on this movement relative to a normal movement are these electrical contacts. I'm going to have to investigate the condition of these uh, to see if they need attention or possibly replacement. That would be a wear component on a clock like this. Um, in the olden days, solenoids were, were used in this fashion and then when they, uh, made, then they disconnected, the magnetic field in the solenoid would collapse and it would create a little tiny arc. And I actually have seen that here on the um, escapement. And there is a modern workaround to that, and that is to put a diode across the solenoid, um, the coil, and then that diode shunts all that extra energy from the magnetic field collapsing when the circuit is broken uh, back around, and that should prevent the arcing, which should mean that the contact should last a lot longer. Um, but we'll get this apart, and I'll get it all cleaned up. Uh, I think I might need to do a couple bushings. This this looks a little suspicious here, and it's just dirty as all get out. And then I will report back when I get to an interesting stopping point. As I'm disassembling, I just want to call to attention a couple notes. Um, sometimes it can be challenging to figure out what side of a clock do you go in on. Uh, my first instinct was to take the uh, verge uh, assembly off, but I actually can't get this off. This appears to be riveted on or something. And so um, I'm going to be careful to not mess anything up that I will have a hard time fixing. So I think um, I'm going to leave that on and I'm going to try to separate the plates rather than to try to take this out. I may be doing that wrong, but I think that's going to be my first step to success. Before you ever separate the plates on a clock, there's a couple things that you need to do. The first thing is you need to remove the power. So if it's a regular spring-driven clock, you need to release the clicks um, while using a letdown key to get rid of the energy. Otherwise, you're going to have a bomb on your hand. This has a small version of that. That's our, our winding mechanism. I need to release the click spring and the solenoid spring here, and then I can run it back. This only, I think, winds about one turn. You can see there's this pin mechanism in the back which is how it, the, the spring drives the time train. So you don't have to unwind it much, but it is important to do that. The other thing is there are a number of components that are mounted between the plates. Chief among them is the main winding solenoid here. So I, I disconnected the wire leads, which go to these tiny screws here on both the front and the back. So that's now free. I think I'm gonna be safe splitting the plates I am going to go in through the back. This one happens to have screws on both sides of the studs here. And um, not that complicated of a movement, so I think I'm going to be okay removing these four screws and the solenoid mounts on this side of the plate. The top plate came off uh, relatively without incident and I want to just point out how absolutely disgusting this clock is. These plates are almost black. There's bimetallic corrosion various places. It's quite a mess. Uh, there's some interesting things here. Here is the verge assembly, and you can see these wooden blocks. The screws on top, apologies for the lighting, 
The screws on top are where those um, coiled wires feed power to the contacts and they have to be insulated from the rest of the clock movement. And so these are wooden blocks, it's hard to get lighting on that, that um, attach it mechanically, but not electrically to the clock. My first instinct when looking at a movement this bad is, gosh, I should probably lacquer the plates so that this uh, isn't gonna happen in the future. And I may still do that, but there is one difference about a clock like this, and that is you have to be careful about what is conductive and what is not. So as I continue to disassemble this, I'm gonna be very careful to understand what is supposed to have electrical contact and what is not. You can see these insulators here. Um, and there are some on the front side of the clock too that I don't know if I can show you without uh, messing things up. But right here, these are terminals on the front of the clock. There are insulators here that I need to make sure continue to do their job and other parts of the clock need to have continuity. So uh, I may go ahead and lacquer it and then make sure that I get what I need and I may have to scrape off a little bit of lacquer if I need something to make contact. But just be careful as you're cleaning it up to pay attention to where the insulators are and where power should and should not be flowing.